Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Today, we have a an interesting story, uh, one that starts out bad but winds up in a good place. So, stay tuned. This is a self-defense or defense of others case from Missouri, and we're going to talk about it here a little bit. Um, I'm going to go through the facts. I'm going to link the opinion below. You should read it. It's a good opinion, uh, but I'm not going to have time to go through the whole factual scenario um, and all of the analysis and stuff by the uh, Court of Appeals here, simply because it uh, would take too long and there's a 15-minute limit on these videos at this point. So here's what happens. A group of friends goes out to go drinking, and one of them, Christopher Endicott, brings along his concealed firearm. While they are out drinking at this place in Soulard, which is in the city of St. Louis, they decide to leave and go to another bar about 1.30 in the morning. As they are leaving the bar at 1.30, one member of the group meets someone he knows, Jarrett Green, who will be referred to as the victim in the opinion. They slap each other on the back, and he says, hey, this is my homeboy, and, and uh, why don't you come along with us to the next bar? And a look sort of passes in between the rest of them, and they're like, nah, we don't want this guy to come with us. You know how that is. I mean, there's all kinds of times when you've probably been in situations where the most annoying person that you know comes up and says, hey, can I join you? And nobody wants to say no, but certainly nobody wants to say yes. Well, in this case, appellant Christopher Endicott said, no, look, you can't come. The victim pulled out a gun, stuffed it in his face, and said, I trump you. And if Mr. Endicott had fired at that point, there would be absolutely no issue with self-defense. But that's not what happened. Cooler heads intervene. They talk the guy down. He puts the gun back in his pocket. They convince him to go his own way. Um... But then when two of the people leave, he decides he's going to go with the people who initially told him no. And instead of just walking quietly away, he walks around, opens the door to Mr. Wells' car. And at that point, our appellant, Mr. Endicott, who is legally armed at that point, pulls his firearm and uh, believing that, apparently believing that Mr. Uh, the, the, the victim was going to harm Mr. Wells, fired and he fell backwards and then even after he had fallen backwards he continued shooting which of course is a very bad idea because it begins to look personal at that point so that's what happened and um the the key errors that were made here were one he left the scene you know the the guilty flea and the righteous are as bold as lions. If, you have, if you're involved in a self-defense shooting, you have to stay there, you have to call the police, you have to give them a statement. And basically, you say, you know, I was afraid for my life and I, you know, I, I defended myself. And you leave it at that and say, I'll give you a full statement after I talk to my lawyer. And that's how you prevent making errors that wind up harming you later on. And indeed, one of the errors made in this case was made that night. Mr. Endicott told the police that the victim swiped at his gun hand with the gun in his hand. But there was video on scene, and he did not have a gun in his hand when he was shot. The gun was found inside the man's trousers. He was under continuous visual surveillance by the cameras the entire time. And obviously that worked against our appellant here. But he believed, quite frankly, that he was protecting his friend. After the police investigation, he was charged with murder and armed criminal action. The case went to trial, and 11 of the jurors voted to acquit, one voted to convict, and stayed with that. Unfortunately for Mr. Uh, Mr. Endicott, it isn't a, a majority rules case in a criminal case. It is, quite frankly, a, it's all or nothing. And in this case, it was nothing. The judge declared a mistrial and set it for retrial. On the, at the retrial, the uh, state obviously learned a few lessons from the first case, and they argued that he had no right to protect his friend. 
And as a result of that, um, the jury convicted him at the second trial. And then, as a result of that, he appealed. The issue on appeal was that the court did not give an instruction on the defense of others. And the reason the court didn't give that instruction was that the defense did not ask for it. This was a tactical error on the part of the attorney. Or it may have been his judgment that that was not really at play here. But it, whether it was or whether it wasn't, the instruction wasn't asked for, it wasn't given, and it wasn't included in the motion for new trial. And as a result of that, instead of getting a re, an, an error review or a review on the basis of uh, the failure of the judge to issue the instruction, instead it had to be judged under the standard of review called plain error. And plain error is a very difficult standard of review to meet. And as a result of that, um, you have to be very careful. You don't ever want to appeal a criminal case on the basis of plain error. But that's what happened. So let's talk about the standard of review in this case. Here is what the appellate court said. Although appellant claims the trial court should have instructed on the use of force of defense of another, he did not request such an instruction, nor did he include this claim in his motion for a new trial. As such, appellant requests plain error review. Unpreserved instructional errors are reviewed under the plain error standard, and we will reverse a man when a manifest injustice or miscarriage of justice would otherwise result. Failure to give a mandatory instruction is trial court error and grounds for reversal on plain error review. An appellate court, when confronted with the argument that trial court erred in refusing to instruct on self-defense, must view all the evidence and all reasonable inferences in the light most favorable to the defendant. And in the end, at the end of the day, this is what saved Christopher Endicott and on the appeal. He got the benefit of all of the reasonable inferences. Here is what the appellate court winds up saying. Our review of the record in the light most favorable to appellant reveals ample evidence to support appellant may have acted in defense of Wells. The evidence at trial shows appellant had taken it upon himself to be the spokesperson and defender of the group during victim's intrusion. Tucker testified that because she was the only female in the group, she was happy to have appellant step forward and speak for her when they encountered the threatening stranger. There's a problem, and you may remember this from the way it was presented in the opinion. The physical evidence did not match up with the testimony of the appellant. We then go to the courts looking at this issue raised by the state. They say the surveillance footage depicting the shooting continued to record up to the, until police arrived at the scene. If victim's gun was in his hand when he was shot, then there is no reasonable explanation for how it was subsequently found in his pocket. However, this is not dispositive for two reasons. First, our analysis focuses not on what the circumstances were, but on how they reasonably appeared to appellant. They cite a, in a footnote a Missouri Supreme Court case, and it says, The Missouri Supreme Court has held that brandishing a deadly weapon constitutes deadly force because the risk of death or serious physical harm is significantly elevated when one of the parties to an angry confrontation displays a handgun. So it was in this case, as the escalation toward the deadly shooting was initiated by a victim's decision to threaten the group with a gun. Second, we note the case does not turn solely on whether a victim's gun was in his hand or even whether appellant reasonably believed it was. Wherever the gun happened to be at the moment of the shooting, the uncontradicted evidence showed victim was still armed when he began entering victim's Wells vehicle. If victim had decided to use his gun against the vehicle's occupants, he only needed to reach into his pocket to retrieve it. And that is a very good point from a very good appellate court. The court then concludes with this paragraph. Because substantial evidence was adduced to trial to warrant an instruction on use of deadly force in defense of another, the trial court committed plain error by not offering such an instruction to the jury. Therefore, the judgment of the trial court is reversed, and this matter is remanded for a new trial. 
this opinion overturned that second trial. And what happened on the third trial? He was acquitted and was set free. Summing up, here are the lessons that we learned from this case. First of all, leave your gun at home if you're going drinking. Second of all, go places where you are going to be safe. John Correa on the channel Active Self-Protection talks about the rules of stupid. And basically, they are this. Don't go stupid places at stupid times. Nothing good happens in the middle of the night at 1.30 in the morning. At stupid times where stupid people are going to make you do stupid things. And that's what happened here. It was stupid place, Soulard Market, a high crime area in St. Louis City, and stupid people, a guy who wouldn't take no for an answer, and he did a stupid thing. He shot him and then he fled, which was a very bad idea. The other thing, the other lessons that come out of this, don't talk to the to the police department without your lawyer present. Don't give a full statement without your lawyer present. And finally, hire the very best lawyer you can, someone who has tried these cases before. Uh, people who are former public defenders will often have a very strong basis to try these kinds of cases. So there we have it. If you have, I think it's an interesting case. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. And as always, thank you for watching and have a terrific day.